Hello and welcome to Casual Veteran Gamer. In the video today, we're going to be looking at the level 1 spells for the wizard class and giving a rating for each of the spells. I've got my four wizards ready here. They are level 3 wizards, which gives them access to level 2 spell slots, which comes up in the video because I'll be letting you know which spells you can use a level 2 spell slot for and which ones give an extra effect for using a level 2 spell slot because some do and some don't. I've got all the possible level 1 spells for wizards. I'm not going to include spells that wizards can learn from scrolls, such as Guiding Bolt, because they're not wizard spells, and I don't know if in the final game they will be included. And I will cover the level 1 scrolls from other classes when I get to those classes in those videos. So do please check out those videos once they're made. One thing I would also say, just as a reminder, is outside of combat, you can change the spells to whatever you want. So you can cast, I don't know, Mage Arm at the beginning of the day and then replace it with something else later in the day, which is a massive benefit of the Wizard class. I'm going to go through these spells in alphabetical order, giving a racing out of 10 based on how useful they are or how much damage they do, whether they require concentration, any other side effects they have, and whether there is a better spell out there f instead of using this particular spell. For our first spell, here we have Burning Hands, which is an evocation spell. There's 3d6 fire damage in an AoE in front of you. And you can cast at level 1 or level 2, where using a level 2 spell slot does an extra 1d6 damage, so 4d6 in total. So it's 3d6 damage, but the enemy gets a dexterity saving throw. If they pass, then you do half damage. So do you want to point out that the range is quite small and if you don't take the evocation subclass, and to find out good reasons why, you should watch my wizard video for that, then I would actually, or you could potentially hurt some of your allies. Now, I've come across something good about Burning Hands by complete accident here. This novice Andrik blinded two of my characters, both wizards, but I can still use this. I don't need to make an attack roll, which is one of the benefits of things with saving throws, and because this AoE comes from the character. You don't need to be able to see anything. Anyway, let's cast it. See it. Whoa, look at that. Quick animation. Downside is you need to be close by. You don't really want to be doing that with your wizard, if you can help it. So overall, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. It's a bit lower than some of the other spells to come. Things I don't like about it is the damage is relatively low, especially when you consider that it can be resisted. On the positive side, it's an AoE, so you can hit more than one creature and is guaranteed damage, but it's not necessarily very much damage. If you don't take the evocation score, it's probably going to go down, because you're going to have to start to position yourself much more carefully. Charm Person is the second spell I'm going to show you. It does use a level 1 level 2 spell slot. Level 2 spell slot doesn't actually give you any benefits. Pick a creature, not a creature, pick a humanoid, and they make a saving throw. If the saving throw par is failed, then the charmed creature can't harm the charmer, and the charmer has advantage on charisma checks against the creature. So, hoping this works. There we are, it was lucky, 40% chance. This enemy had already cast Bless on themselves, so they had given themselves extra d4 on their saving throws, it's only 40% chance. Anyway, let's see what happens. And this is the huge downside to Charm Person. It's almost pointless. So you use a level 1 spell slot to potentially charm someone. There's only a low chance. And then if they fail the saving throw, the only thing that enemy can't do in combat is attack the caster. But you're going to have probably at least three other people in your team. There might be some other people around that could get attacked also. So overall... This isn't a very good spell. There is another effect. The Charmer has advantage on Christmas checks against the creature. We've got a cantrip for that called Friends. So Charm Person is almost a redundant spell. It's very low down on my list. I'm going to give it a 2 out of 10. There might be some situations. Perhaps you could cast it on a boss so it doesn't attack your squishy wizard. Color Spray is the next spell I'm going to cover. So what it does create a dazzling array of flashing coloured lights that blinds creatures up to a combined 33 hit points. This is similar to the sleep spell, which we'll cover later. You can cast at level 2, which increases the number of hit points to 44. It's got a relatively short range, it's not great, but 
There's no saving throw. Uh, you can't accidentally actually do it to your allies. You might have to be careful. So I'm going to do it on this warg. And the warg will be blind. It's got no choice. Boom. Blinded. And this uh, you could affect more than one creature. It depends on the hit point totals. The hit point total for colour spray is higher than sleep, which is nice. Uh, so now this creature is blind, we'll have disadvantage on all attacks. And if there's a creature that wants to cast a spell at range, it can't see. So it won't be able to cast ranged spells. So overall, going to give this a 7 out of 10. The slight downsides are the short range, which compared to sleep isn't quite as good. And you can't control who it hits. It'll always target the creatures, creature or creatures with the lowest number of hit points. But it's still going to be good. Uh, there's no, it's not a bad pick at all. For our fourth spell, I'm going to be looking at Disguise Self. So it doesn't require concentration. I can only cast it using a level 1 spell slot. There's no option here to cast it with level 2. And when you click on Disguise Self, you get to choose Disguise Self female halfling, male halfling. So you've got female and male versions of every race currently available to you as a player character. So maybe I want to be a female human. Who knows, All right? Cast it. And now my character is a female human. I can walk around. And maybe I want to cast it again, but it takes another spell slot to do this. So maybe I want to be a male halfling instead. But uh, I've just used up an extra spell slot to do that. Now, in terms of utility, it's... It's not really that great. It doesn't give you the racial benefits of turning into that race. I think that should be quite obvious. It's just like a disguise. Magical disguise. And in combat, it's useless. But out of combat, it's not completely useless. There are some situations where being a different race will give you different dialogue options. But it's not game-changing. Not really. Uh, very few places is it game-changing. So I'm overall I'm not really that impressed with this spell, considering I've got other spells to be choosing from. So I'm only going to give it a 4 out of 10. There's some situations where it's useful, but outside of those situations, I'd rather just be casting something else. Uh, this isn't a spell I really want to cast. So here is Expeditious Retreat. Cast level 1 or level using level 1 or level 2 spell slot. Level 2 spell slot doesn't seem to do anything extra. This is a bonus action but can only be cast on yourself. Now, what it does, the turn you cast it, it increases your speed. So for example, I could run up to 60 feet. And then also, on subsequent turns, you can use dash as a bonus action, which appears in the hotbar. And you can still use dash as an action. So this is good to get away. If you're too close to danger, so my wizard here has got an owlbear cub there, and there's some distressed owlbear over here, and let's say, you know, discretion is the better part of valor. I can start running away, which is which is good, which is great, right? A long way to run. If you really need to, dash as your action, and off we go. We're, we're getting out of there. So on the turn you cast it, you can go a very long way. And then actually subsequent turns, if you're using a bonus action and action to dash, you can still still go a very long way. Downside to this is it requires your concentration. And the only other benefit is you can use dash as a bonus action. So it isn't actually that great. And it's okay, but maybe you want to be using your concentration for something else. And hopefully your wizard isn't in that much danger anyway. And you can only cast it on yourself. So overall, I'm not that impressed. I'd probably rather just use my bonus action to jump, which will fix most things. So overall, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. It's really not that great. I'm not always looking to get this spell. Because after combat, outside of combat, this is not actually useful. Because you have to use a bonus action outside of combat, you just get the same speed, so you can't get anywhere faster. False Life is a level 1 necromancy spell, which gives you 7 temporary hit points at the beginning of the day, if you cast at the beginning of the day. You can use a level 2 spell slot and give yourself 12 temporary hit points. 
Now considering at level, okay, I've got my characters at level 3, so I can show you which spells can use a second level spell slot. And at level 3, give yourself an extra 7 temporary hit points. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you've only got 20 to begin with, that's 35% extra hit points before you die, which is amazing, and you, it's almost like pre-healing. You give, this, give this to yourself. Last until your next long rest doesn't require concentration. This is a spell you can cast at the beginning of the day to prepare. Cast false life and then cast any of the buffs I want to cast at the beginning of the day. And that's it. Extra 7 hit points. I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. Because it doesn't require concentration. You get your extra hit points. And you can then swap out the spell for another spell later. So there's false life. Okay, get rid of false life. And maybe I want to cast Thunder Wave instead in combat. Feather Fool is next. Uses a bonus action to cast. Quite rare for most spells. And inflicts Feather Fall. So slows the rate of descent of allied creatures. Grants immunity to falling damage. So this does cover your whole party. But unfortunately, before I cast it, it only lasts 10 turns. It lasts for a minute. Doesn't require concentration, so that's okay. So the fact that it uses a bonus action means you could cast this on your party and then cast another spell in combat. But means you can't cast this and then use jump on the same turn within combat. Outside of combat, obviously that doesn't matter. So there we are, feather fall. And then we can jump disengage all the way down there, which is quite a long way. Or even further. And not suffer any damage. Now, in terms of rating for this spell, it's not going to be very high. It's just a 6 out of 10. Although it doesn't require concentration, it's got a limited time limit. So it only lasts 10 turns. And the number of places you need to use this where it really comes in useful is quite low. There aren't many places where you really need to have feather fall. It's not game changing in any way. I probably could have just yeah, I could have just climbed down here. No problem. And you can't cast it as a reaction, which you can in D and D fifth edition. So if you're being thrown off somewhere, you can't use a reaction to cast it, which is what you would do normally in D and D. Fine familiar is next, and there's a little, little bit to go over here because when you cast fine familiar, you get to choose one of six different familiars. And they're all a little bit different. So first up, Spider. I'm going to go through this as quickly as possible. Spider can hide, dash, or arachnid jump, which range 60 feet. So actually, the Spider can jump a really long way. And then its action is Bite, which is one piercing if it hits, and 1d4 poison damage. So all of the familiars here can do a little bit of damage and maybe give a secondary effect in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Familiars cannot attack directly. They cannot use the attack action, but they can here. However, we can't use any help action here. So first of all, yeah, we've got the spider. So it does piercing and a bit of poison damage with a long jump. Each time I'm doing this is using up a spell slot, so I wouldn't advise doing this. Here we've got the raven. One hit point, so if it's hit, it's dead. But if it attacks, then it can blind a enemy find an enemy which is useful next up rat again only one hit point uh, if it hits it can cause an infection which description is here infected creatures of disadvantage and constitution saving throws and the constitution is reduced by one so if you can get your rat to attack something decrease the constitution saving throw then you can cast one of your other spells which targets constitution saving throws. So this can be helpful if you kind of debuffing the enemy. Next up, frog. Again, one hit point, not amazing. It does one acid damage and potentially receives, the target potentially receives disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. So just like with the rat, you can maybe give a debuff to the enemy which can then help your spells or maybe some other effects here's the crab two hit points wow right uh deals slashing damage applies bleeding and decreases the speed by 10 feet put some good debuffs on the enemies there 
And then lastly, we have the cat. Two hit points. So attract the attention of nearby creatures to draw them closer to you. So this is kind of like a taunting, which in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, the actual the tabletop game, there aren't very many taunting mechanics, and in this game there aren't either. Mostly they try and they target whoever they want to. So this is quite unique. So good things about Find Familiar, you get a choice of Familiar, they've got different side effects. They do, however, only have very few hit points, between one and six, most of them having one or two hit points. Doesn't require concentration. This is a, this is a decent spell. Uh, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. If you've got a range on your party, it's probably going to be much lower. Or if you've got a warlock, which can summon imp, an imp familiar or quasi familiar, this isn't so useful. So if you're going to play a party that has either a ranger and plays and has the beastmaster ranger, or has the warlock that can summon a familiar, there's really not much point in getting it on your wizard. So kind of depending on your party composition, if you've got one of those two classes in your party, this is more like a 4 or 5 out of 10. Uh, you've got other things you can be doing with your spells. One thing you can use your familiars for is scouting ahead. So I've got control of the cat. I'm going to make it hide. So it's creeping around. So you can put your familiar in danger before you. Make it jump around. You should keep it hiding to be honest. Keep it hiding. There's a big bad, big bad out there. There. But it doesn't matter, right? Since the cat isn't a player character, you can scout ahead. If there are neutral creatures, it's fine. If there are hostile creatures, it's not fine actually, and it would probably be attacked. So fine, familiar, good for scouting, good for causing other effects. It's good for taking a hit or two, maybe, rather than the enemies attacking your party. They can attack one of your familiars. So yeah, overall, 8 out of 10. Next we have Fog Cloud. So this doesn't deal any damage, but this is a great battlefield control spell. So what it will do is, at level 1, you can pick where to put this, and it will create a Fog Cloud. And you'll be able to hide inside it with your characters. I do want to point out this is one of the spells that can have a level 2. And actually the area is larger. So depending on what size of area you want to cover, level 2 might be more appropriate than level 1. But level 2 spell slots are rare. You always want to be careful. Right, right here. I can cover my whole party. Now they're all blinded. Which you know, sounds bad. Uh, I'll wait till another turn from one of my characters. Right. So it gives disadvantage to them. So I can come out and then cast another spell. I'm not poison spray. Come back inside and hide. I'm going to make everyone hide and see what happens. You can see he's aiming for the people who aren't hiding. To wait a few turns from the enemy. That person just can't reach us yet. So they summoned a companion. So for hide, it looks like she's going to die soon. Whoops. They can't see us. So this could almost be cheesed. You can create up a fog cloud. Come out, attack, come back in and hide. Let's try that. So we're going to come out of the fog clouds. Going to be seen, no problem. Going to cast a spell. Come back in. Hide. And if I just keep others hidden. And that's it. They're not going to attack us. So my raising for this is, at a, in its current state, if the AI lets us hide inside the fog cloud, just basically 10 out of 10. Because the enemy is not going to hit you. If they change that in the future, still would probably give it about an 8 out of 10 because it's going to give some disadvantage to rolls against you because you're going to be obscured and yeah battlefield control only downside to it really is that it's concentration so you can't concentrate on anything else and 
if you get hit, concentration can be dropped. Greece with a picture of a pig, which is reminiscent of Baldur's Gate, which used the same sort of diagram, same picture to represent Greece. So, level one, we can cast it at level two, but it doesn't do anything extra, it's just you can use a level two spell slot. What it does is create an area of, well, Greece. And when you, when you first cast it, any creatures within the area, obviously a mist, sharp eye Gerza there, has to make a dexterity saving throw, otherwise they fall prone. And any creatures that try to move through it will count as having being in difficult terrain. And so this is a battlefield control spell. So you can fill up areas with the grease. Generally, I think the enemies do try and avoid it if they can. So even if they don't go through it, they're going to spend extra movement going around it. You can try and funnel creatures. And so this is really good for trying to make creatures prone. When creatures are prone, they will fail dexterity saving throws automatically. But of course, this turn, so he gets up. That's what he wants to do. I just wanted to show you one more thing with Grease. Right, so Grease here, we can see hovering over it, it says flammable. So you can create an area on the ground, the surface. And then explode it. Obviously all the creatures are just outside of the area, so nothing really happened there. But if you've got two turns in a row with two of your allies, you can create grease, potentially knock some creatures prone, and then if you've got someone who's got maybe fire arrows or some sort of fire spell, you can set it alight to do some extra damage. You do not need concentration for this. So I'm going to give grease an 8 out of 10. It's battlefield control, potentially causing some damage, potentially making people prone, making some difficult terrain, uh, so it's got some really good utility to it. And maybe a little bit of damage if you can set it alight. Jump is next. It can be cast using level 1 or level 2 spell slot, though the level 2 spell slot gives no advantage. Target creature within 5 feet. Target myself. And what it does is triples your jump distance. Now, even for someone with a lowly strength, such as a wizard, I can now jump all this distance, and it will only take 10 feet of movement. Now, we do not require concentration, which is great, but it only lasts 10 turns. So it's the sort of thing that will last pretty much for one combat. If And if you put this on a on a character that has a high strength score, so a fighter, Lazelle was a good uh, good candidate for this. She can jump immense amounts, insane distances. So now my wizard can't quite get up there, but can jump all this way. It's only used 10 feet of movement. It can move another 20 feet still to get up to there. Now, she jumped on her own turn as, same turn as casting the spell, to, she can't do anything else. But if you cast this on someone else, and it, it lasts for more than a turn. So it's not just a one-hit wonder sort of thing. So this is an amazing spell to cast on characters who want to be jumping around the battlefield to get into the fray or come back to save people. So I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. Unfortunately, the main downside I feel is it only lasts for one combat. It would be much nicer if it lasted for longer, though, again, probably too powerful if it did. Long Strider is the next spell I'm going to cover. It inflicts Long Strider as if it's a bad thing. Touch a creature to increase its speed by 10 feet. Simple. You can cast it on yourself or another creature and last until your next long rest. So you can cast it level 1 or level 2 spell slot. But the casting at level 2 doesn't give you any extra benefits. You can cast it and that's it. So in these videos you might see some of my wizards have got this swirling green animation. Those are the ones that I've got long stride, kind of green. And interestingly, when creatures are in something that is difficult to rain, it slows them down, their feet become red. Anyway, to the spell, great utility, extra 10 feet. You don't have to cast it on the wizard. I've just got a party full of wizards at the moment to show as many spells as possible. But you can cast it on your rogue so they can get into that position to sneak attack even better and get them out of danger even more quickly. Bear in mind, enemies have got a normally have got a speed of 40 feet, whereas yours is norm normally 30 feet, although if you're a dwarf or halfling, it'll be 25 feet. So this puts you on par with the enemies for the most part, and it does not require concentration. So what I love to do at the start of the day is cast Long Strider, which I am going to give an 8 out of 10, because we don't need concentration cast on anyone who doesn't want to be able to move five, 10 feet faster. And then what I love to do with my wizard which leads me on to the next spell, Mage Armor. 
Surrounded creature in a protective magical force, its armor class is increased by 3, as long as it's not wearing any armor. Again, we can cast it with a level 1 or level 2 spell slot, but there's no benefit of casting at level 2 compared to level 1. Unless, of course, you've run out of level 1 spell slots. But you shouldn't have a, that should ever happen with mage armor. Yeah, I'm going to cast it on myself. Now, the armor class is just that much higher. So the armor class of the wizard is now 15 instead of what it used to be would have been 12 and that's quite a big difference it's still going to get hit quite a lot as a wizard if your armor class is 15 and you're in the way but having 15 compared to 12 is a significant difference and it can be cast on anyone not just yourself in the future with some other classes i don't know if this will be changed because it just increases armor class by three which is quite a big boost and doesn't require concentration you've got it for the rest of the day for until the next long rest just like long strider for me major armor is 10 out of 10 there's literally just, there's no good reason not to take it on your wizard. Extra three armor class. Boom. Done. Thank you very much. So what I love to do with my wizards, when I've got them, cast long stride at the beginning of the day, cast mage arm at the beginning of the day, then use the arcane recovery action to recover two level one spell slots. And then we can go about the rest of our day with all the spell slots. And the way that resting works in Baldur's Gate 3, there's no reason not to do this. Because then you use all your spell slots, go have a long rest. And you are pre-buffing yourself. You don't have to waste actions in combat. Magic Missile is next. Absolutely classic spell of a wizard. You can pick it level 1, level 2. Level 1 has creates 3 darts of force. Level 2 creates 4 darts of magical force. And as long as you've got line of sight to the enemy, or your target, if you want to target someone neutral, it will hit. There's no rolling to hit. There's a 100% chance. The only thing that is, sometimes happens is that the magical missiles might hit something that's in the way. That isn't always predicted by the path. Which, compared to the 5th edition game, uh, is worse. In the 5th edition, you cast magic missile, boom, it hits. So it casts up to three projectiles, which can be on the same target, or two or three different targets. The actual damage is quite low. It's 1d4 plus 1 per magic missile. And let's just see it in action. Up they go, bam, they hit, and they're dead. Now, I haven't seen some people dislike the... dislike how it looks, because it's, they're not like magical darts. I really quite like how they look, because it reminds me of Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2, and that was the first sort of my introduction I ever had to Dungeons and Dragons. Anyway, for my rating, I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10, and it's not because it does loads of damage, but the fact it is so reliable, and we can see how many hit points enemies have got left, you can reliably kill something if they've got a low enough number of hit points. Now, some of you might argue that, oh, we have to get to a low number of hit points first. But you know, you don't have to use it for that. You can use it to soften the target up. Just the fact that it is certain to hit, it makes it far and above better than most other spells because almost every other spell either has an attack roll or saving throw. Not every spell uh, doesn't do damage if it misses. There's some spells that still do damage if the enemy passes the saving throw but the fact that you get to choose you can split it up between one or three or four if you use level two spell slot and it's guaranteed damage makes it something every wizard should have and actually i think on this playthrough i've got every wizard has magic missile ready because that's how good i think this spell is Next up is Protection from Evil and Good, a level 1 Abjuration spell. It's Concentration, and when you cast it, it will protect you against Aberrations, Celestials, Elementals, Fays, Fiends, and Undead, which sounds like an awful lot of different types of creature. Currently, in Early Access, there aren't that many types of creature that fall under one of those. There are a few Fiends at the beginning. Um, I think one Aberration? Maybe there's more, I've just forgotten. Some Undead. Um, and I've I don't think any celestials or elementals in the game. Maybe there are, and I've just forgotten. Anyway, while you're under the protection of the spell, the target can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by those types of creatures, and those types of creatures attack with disadvantage. Unfortunately, this requires concentration, and unfortunately, and it targets a single creature, and as I've already said, there aren't that many types of creatures that are that this spell protects against. I mean, yeah, we can use the level 2 spell slot, but it doesn't do anything extra. 
So he can target other people. That requires concentration. If there weren't very many good points to the spell. Unless you're in a fight with loads of undead. Even then, they've got attacks of disadvantage doesn't mean they're going to miss. You can still drop concentration. I'm going to give this a 3 out of 10. There aren't very many upsides to this. It's basically a waste of a spell known and a spell prepared. There's no real need to have this spell. You can just hide. You can try and hide. You can create a fog cloud. And then that gives all the enemies disadvantage. They might not be able to see you. There are better spells to use in protection from evil and good. Ray of Sickness is next, which can be cast using level 1 or level 2 spell slot. Level 2 spell slot does increase the damage done. So you can target a single creature and deal 2d8 poison damage. And then that creature makes a saving throw. And if it passes saving throw, then they will have the poison condition, which gives them disadvantage on their attacks. So let's see it work. And they were poisoned, so the damage was unfortunately very low, but that's just luck for you. Because uh, it's out of 2d8. Uh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, it's out of 2d8. And I managed to do three damage. But down here, there's three poison damage. The saving throw is eight, so they failed. So now they are poisoned. Here's a poison condition. So there's disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. So sometimes this spell doesn't have, isn't given a good reputation. Now I'm not saying it's the best spell ever or anything, but I like it for two reasons. One, it's a guaranteed 2d8 damage, which compared to a country such as Ray of Frost, it does twice as much damage. And then it's got the possibility to give someone disadvantage, to give, make someone poisoned. Unfortunately, they can pass a saving throw, and unfortunately, poisoned is resisted by several different enemy types. So this isn't the most useful spell, but I don't think it's so bad. So I, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Because it's guaranteed damage, and there's a possibility of giving disadvantage. Sleep is next, another spell that we can cast at using a first level or second level spell slot, and that makes a difference. First level, you can put to sleep 24 hit points worth of creatures, at second level, 32 hit points worth of creatures. Good things about this, we can cast it at range. When you put creatures to sleep, it lasts for two rounds, I believe, and it takes them out of the turn. So you can either ignore them, or... You can try to hit them, but as soon as you hit them, they'll wake up. So it's really pointless to put someone to sleep and wake them back up. But the fact you can choose where you want to put it is great. You, so you can use a level 2 spell slot. Might not be the wisest thing, depending on how many hit points of creatures are left. Downside is it always affects the creature with the lowest number of hit points first. So you can't just pick whoever you want. Now in here, there are only two creatures, so it's only going to pick those two. But if there was a third creature here that was an enemy, it would first of all put Brawler Gresh to sleep for 8 hit points, and then another 10 for Tracker Torak, and then if the other enemy had more than 6 hit points, it isn't used. If the other, if there was another enemy and it had 23 hit points, I, we cannot target it, we cannot put it to sleep. My rating for sleep is still going to be relatively high, I'm going to put it at a 9 out of 10, because you knocking creatures out of a turn of combat is really powerful. Any of you who paid Divinity at Original Sin 2, well, when I played it, this was always my target, put someone out of the turn, and you just keep having your turns and not getting hurt. So I'm going to put both these out of, out of the turn order, they go to sleep, and I'm still using Fog Cloud, come back in and hide. Thunder Wave is up next, an evocation spell, does 2d8 thunder damage if they fail the saving throw, and you can cast a level 1 spell slot, a level 2 spell slot, the level 2 does increase the amount of damage done. Oh, I do you know what, I love this spell just for the sound it makes. So it's an AoE, unfortunately close range, uh, kind of in a cube, and it will hit all enemies inside the cube, and do 2d8 damage, and potentially throw them back if they fail a constitution saving throw. If they pass a throw, some damage still gets done, but only half the amount. So let's see it work. Now that was amazing, because they both, all of them failed the saving throw, knocked them all dead. Obviously these are just goblins, which have some of the lowest number of hit points for enemies. But I really like the spell, apart from the sound it makes. Because it's guaranteed damage. 
There aren't many spells that give you guaranteed damage. It's an AoE, so you can affect more than one creature at once. And can knock people back, which if you've got someone on a cliff or a ledge, you knock them off the ledge, do extra damage. This is one of, one of my favourites. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. I'm not going to make it any higher because you do need to be at close range and there is a saving throw. If I could cast this at range, maybe it'd be too powerful. Uh, but even if they pass the saving throw, you still do some damage. So if you're close to some creatures and you don't manage to knock them back, it's probably a good idea to have your jump or disengage action ready just to get out of there. For the very last spell, we have Witch Bolt. So it does 1d12 lightning damage, you need an attack roll to hit something, and if you hit an enemy, it does 1d12 damage. And then on subsequent turns, later turns, you can use your action to automatically do another 1d12 damage. Concentration is required to be able to use the action in subsequent turns. Now at first it sounds amazing, like who doesn't want a guaranteed 1d12 damage? But when you start comparing it to some other spells, it's really not that great. And the fact that it uses your action, which can be means you can't cast any other spells while well, you've got Witch Bolt going. I mean you can cast other spells, sorry, but then you're not using Witch Bolt, which is used a spell slot to cast. And it's only, kind of only 1d12 damage when you can cast Firebolt for 1d10. And we can do that as many times as we like, whereas Witch Bolt uses a first level spell slot. And secondly, it requires concentration. And if you drop your concentration, then you've potentially wasted your level 1 spell slot to do 1d12 damage. Unless maybe you're fighting a monster that has loads of hit points, in which case maybe, maybe I would use this. Because then you can repeatedly do 1d12 damage, which is slightly higher than 1d10. The other downside is if you target a creature, let's say, I don't know if it's going to hit. There you are. Okay, does 6 damage. If I'd rolled higher than 10 for him, for example, it would have been a waste. I may as well just use Firebolt for the most part. So creatures with a low number of hit points, this is not useful for. If you're fighting multiple creatures, you probably don't want to use this level 1 spell slot on this. I'd much rather use one of the AoE spells. So this is kind of a bit of a trap spell. There's no, not particularly good reason to use this, considering it uses your action, and spell slot, and concentration, and it's only 1d12, and it's only against one creature, and when that creature dies, you can't transfer it even. It's really not that good. So I'm going to give it a 3 out of 10. Uh, only giving it a 3, because maybe, just maybe, if you're fighting a creature with lots of hit points, you've got a chance to deal out more damage than a, than a cantrip from using a first level spell slot. But as soon as any creature dies, that's it. The spell's wasted. So that's been a look at all of the level 1 spells for wizards. Just a few final thoughts. Basically some spells you shouldn't take, probably, and some spells which are usually very good. So first of all, spells to avoid, because they're essentially just not very good. Trap spells either have something else that does, does it better or just has a really bad effect. So I would definitely avoid Charm Person, Protection from Good and Evil, and Witch Belt. Either they require concentration or the effects are just useless, really not that useful or rarely used. And then three of the best spells that I would pretty much always take. One, Magic Missile, guaranteed damage. Second, Fog Clouds, you can hide inside it and the enemy isn't going to look for you currently. Maybe after early access that will change. And the third one is Mage Armor, because who wants to be hit? If you've enjoyed it, Please leave a like and a subscription is always greatly appreciated and don't forget to check out the other videos I've got that are rating the spell lists from different classes.